Said child, that's our roadmap for living. The way that God can talk to me and you. That's the truth you can depend on. The truth that'll never lead you wrong. The word of God that'll never pass away. That's the truth. Truth that'll save you from your sin. From the eldest to the youth, that's the truth. Mama drew her strength from the Bible. She prayed on every promise and made it her. truth that'll save you from your sin. From the eldest to the youth, that's the truth. Through the ages, men have tried to change it and water down its message with their lies. But the truth is marching stronger As the darkness closes in on this world full of sin, look around you, not many are left standing. The word of God's been compromised, holy living criticized, and iniquity on every hand abounding. So if you have a place to go where the old story is being told and the man of God will preach the word with power don't forsake it my friend as we're nearing the end for it's the strength that you need for this hour so much the more as you see day approaching so much the more as his coming is at hand you need the church and the saints and the worship of the lord to stand faithful to the end so much the more there's a famine As for me and my house will serve the Lord so much the more as you see the day approaching so much the more as his coming is at hand you need the church and the saints and the worship of the Lord to stand faithful to the end. 
Brother Winstead is going to come and preach. Uh, Pastor Winstead will preach, right? And it's good to have him. I appreciate his passion during this time. He really has been passionate. He's kind of a, you know, some might think a quiet person, but he's really not. Uh, he's a professional protester now. I'm just joking with him. It says he's on the news and things like that. Uh, but he's been a real blessing, and I, I appreciate him. And so uh, he's going to preach. And then, Brother Winstead, make sure that you take the invitation time. Piano player, you come up, and let's have a little time of just quiet and meditate and uh, just talk with the Lord a little bit and then close out the service for us, all right? Well, I'll come up and do the final prayer. How about that? All right, thank you. Yeah, he calls me a professional protester with all the protests that are going on right now. That really should be clarified. I gotta say. <laughs> oh. My goodness. All right. <laughs> well, if you have your Bible, hopefully you do, uh, turn to Colossians chapter 1, if you would. Uh, I, I have had so many thoughts going through my mind for so long, and it's really hard to try to condense it down to something uh, coherent, for one, uh, but then also something that uh, is organized and um, a challenge. And I think one of the biggest problems is that I've got so many thoughts going through my mind, and I pray, you know, and talk to God about them all, and there's just a lot of questions that I have. I think we all have a lot of questions. And, um, and so it's just difficult to kind of get God's mind on the whole thing all at once. Some questions there's answers, and others there's not. Anybody else ever been in a situation where you needed an answer, but you just didn't have one at the time? I've been in that circumstance a lot in my life. It seems for some reason that God likes to keep me there for whatever reason, I'm not sure, but I know that his will and his way is the best. Um, and he's definitely proven that. Whenever I've decided to trust him and do things his way, even if I couldn't understand it, uh, whenever I just kept doing the things that I knew to do because I didn't know what else to do, you know, he's always come through in the end. So I don't doubt that he will in this circumstance as well. Uh, but tonight we're going to look at Colossians chapter 1, and um, really the whole chapter, in a sense here. And it's interesting, as I was reading through this uh, chapter, how, at least in my mind, it applies to what I'm going through in this time. And you look at the different things that are going on, and there's a prayer, in fact, that Paul prays here, starting in verse number 9, uh, and he, he's praying for these people. And I'm thinking, wow, this is a, this is a really good prayer that we should all be praying for each other right now. And uh, so let's start in verse, chapter, verse uh, uh, number one of chapter one tonight. It says, uh, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God and Timotheus, our brother, to the saints and faithful brethren in Christ, which are at Colossae, grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We give thanks to God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you. Since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love which ye have to all the saints, for the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, whereof ye heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel, which is come unto you as it is in all the world, and bringeth forth fruit as it doth also in you since the day ye heard of it and knew the grace of God in truth. As ye also learned of Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who is for you a faithful minister of Christ, who also declared unto us your love in the Spirit. Now because they heard of this, uh, um, their love, and they heard of this, uh, the, the, of the folks here. It says in verse number nine, for this cause we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to desire that you might be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. And isn't that a good prayer to pray right now? I mean, it's always a good prayer to pray. But he says they're not ceasing, which is a good thing as well, not ceasing to pray for these folks. And what are they praying? That they might be filled with the knowledge of his will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding. And man, if there was ever a day and a time that we needed to know what God's will was and have that spiritual knowledge and that spiritual understanding that can only come from God, man, this is the day and time that we need it. Goodness. And in verse 10 it says that you might, and this is continuing, they're praying, first of all, for that. And in verse 10, they're also praying that you might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. 
Yeah, that's a good thing, too, if you think about it, that you might walk worthy of the Lord. I can't tell you how many times in my life that I have prayed and just said, God, help me to just live my life in a way that would, that would just make what you did on the cross worth it. Now, I know that as a human being and the sacrifice that he made and everything that I could ever give him, it could never repay him for what he's done. But boy, I just want to live my life as sold out as I can for God, for what he's done for me. And he's praying here that you might walk worthy of the Lord. Boy, that would be a prayer that I would have uh, for sure. Being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. Strengthened with all might according to his glorious power unto all patience and long suffering with joyfulness. How many of you by nature are patient and long suffering? Mm. You might say, you might think, some might think that I am. It's not true. <laughs> it's not true. It's not true. If you ever drive with me in a vehicle, you will see how quickly the patience and the long suffering just tends to disappear. And uh, now sometimes it looks like it's there and I'm quiet and I don't say very much, but that doesn't mean necessarily that I'm patient and long-suffering. And I don't know what it is about driving, it just changes me into a different person. And uh, i got to pray about it, honestly, I really do. Uh, but here is something where they're praying, they're saying, you know, give the patience, give long-suffering. And you know what, we need some patience and some long-suffering right now. There's some things going on that we're going to have to deal with, whether we want to or not, for a while. And we need some patience and long-suffering. We also need strength. As it started out in verse 11, strengthen with all might according to his glorious power. And I really like how it says according to his glorious power because we don't have to do it on our own. Isn't that good? Because I tell you, my power is often not sufficient. Often not sufficient. But his, I mean, it's, it's, it's glorious power. I mean, you just look at it, man, th th this is unbelievable. Th this is glorious. This is wonderful. He's got more power than we could ever need. And he promises we don't have to do things on our own. I am sure thankful for that. Look at verse number 12. It says, Giving thanks unto the Father, which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. Now, we get to partake in that inheritance. Isn't that something? We get to do that? Do we deserve it? No. No. We say, oh, we're the good ones. We're standing up for right. Are we really good? Are we? If we were really good, would we need, would, would, would have we needed to die on the cross? No. But we get to be partakers of that inheritance. You know what? No matter what is going on in the world around us, we have a lot to thank God for. We have a lot. And we ought to be giving him thanks. I know right now we're spending on probably a lot of time praying and asking God for things. But man, we sure ought to thank him for our salvation still. We ought to thank him for the families that we have, the freedoms that we have been able to experience in our lifetime and the freedoms that we still do have. There's a lot that we can thank God for, and we ought to. Let's not forget about that. In verse 13, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. Do you know that no matter how wicked and evil this world gets, that you never have to sin? You never have to, because you're free from that power. If you've accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior, you have the freedom to never sin. Now, oftentimes I realize we make the wrong choice, and we let ourselves go back into that bondage, but you know, you don't have to do that. You never have to become wicked. You never have to do wrong. You're free from that, and I'm thankful for that. In verse 14, it says, In whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. How many sins do you need forgiveness for? Did you ever take... I don't know, a couple minutes in a day and just think about how much you need that forgiveness of God. Now, we don't want to dwell on the things that we've done wrong because God doesn't condemn us. If you're saved, God says, I, I, I haven't come into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through me might be saved. So we don't have to spend time condemning ourselves for the sins that we've committed. But did you ever think about just how much he's forgiven you for? Just in the past week, <laughs> past month, past year, man, he's a good God. Who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature? For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created by him and for him. You know, every single power that's working right now, God created it. It's for him. Now, all these things in here, are, they're not all necessarily good. But God says they're for me. And see, as much as they might think they are conniving 
and doing all these little secret plans and they're manipulating the church of God and the people of God and, and all the things that are going on right now, they have it under control. God says, no, you're working for me. You're working for me. And I always go back to that verse in, in Psalms chapter 2 where God says he laughs at the plans of the wicked. I really like that verse because a lot of times I look at the plans of the wicked and I say, <laughs> I don't think that's the laugh that God has, you know? <laughs> Mine, mine isn't the laugh of, oh, we got this handled sometimes. Sometimes it's like, oh, <laughs> you know. And I think that's the way that God just laughs at it because that's all it is to him. They think they have all these amazing plans. They're going to do whatever they want to do, and they can fix this. And God says, no, you're working for me. You don't understand. You're doing exactly what I'm wanting you to do. And we're going to get talk about that again at the end, but uh, let's continue on. It says in 17, and he is before all things, and by him all things consist. Do you realize if God just decided to not allow things to exist, they just simply wouldn't? If God said, mm, I'm, not, I'm not just not going to think about it, Poof, gone, done. No, I mean, <laughs> well, where did all those plans go? Where did all that might and power of whatever you want to say, it's just gone. The only reason it can even exist is because God permits it to be there. I go back and I think about the, uh, the uh, sermon that Jonathan Edwards preached, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God, comparing uh, each person to that, that spider hanging by a thread over a fire. And it's just the pleasure of God that keeps them from falling in. There's no reason why they shouldn't fall in. There's no, I mean, there's, there's nothing really catching them there. It's just simply because God wants it to be. And, and the fact is, God has a lot of power. By him, everything consists. In verse 18, it says, And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. And if there's anything I want to focus on tonight, it's that last part. That in all things he might have the preeminence. Let's pray real quick. Lord, I pray you'd help me to say everything I should tonight. I'm not going to be long, and I'm not really how to, sure how to say what you want me to say tonight, but I pray that it would uh, just uh, be what it is you'd have. Lord, I pray that you would just rebuke Satan and his principality so that they can't influence or distract anyone tonight. I just pray that you'd help us all to hear you tonight and allow you to work in our lives. Uh, I just thank you for the fact that you love us. I thank you for the fact that you're willing to put up with us. And I pray that you would uh, just do something special in all of our hearts tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. The preeminence. God is not first. And I know a lot of times we put him first, and we should. But when it says that he ought to have the preeminence, preeminence is not simply something that's in first place. It's something that is above everything. Everything else is below it. Everything. It's not simply a matter of doing something for God first in a day. It's having him be above everything that we do, everything that we say, everything that we think, something that is at the forefront of our minds at every moment of every day. That's what the preeminence is. I have struggled so much through what has been going on trying to know where... Where are the lines drawn between reaching this world for Christ? Because that is the, the utmost goal. God says, you know, you go out into the highways and byways, compel them to come in, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel. We are supposed to get the gospel of God to the world. And he has asked that of us. That is our reason for being alive is to get the gospel out. But yet I'm also an American. You know, there's a lot of people that, that, that fought and died to give us freedom. And I feel that as an American citizen, living in that freedom that they gave, I've got a responsibility to stand up for that and not just allow it to be taken away. So I have fought inwardly, very difficultly, and prayed a lot about, God, where do the lines fall? Because if I carry my freedom fighting as far as I would want it to go, well, doesn't that hinder then my ability to reach certain groups of people because of my attitude toward certain laws that have been put out. And so I have prayed and prayed and said, God, where, where do my responsibilities fall? I want to do right by you. I also want to do right by my country. Now, again, going back to that thought of what do you do? 
when you don't know what to do. Years and years ago, I thought I had my life planned out. Actually, years and years and years and years ago. So I got to add those on. I thought I had my life planned out. And I was doing things, and I thought I was serving the Lord. I thought I was doing what I was supposed to do, and I wasn't doing wicked things. I wasn't living my life, you know, for myself. I, I thought I was living for the Lord. But I went to a conference, and God talked to me about some things. Every night of that conference, he was saying, you need to do this. You need to stop doing this. You need to double this. You need to get on board with this. And every night, I just, just felt like, man, I, I really got to make some steps in my life, change some things, get closer to what God wants me to be. But at the end of the week, I still felt like there was something deep inside that God was saying that he wanted, but I didn't know what it was. I felt like something wasn't right, but I didn't know what it was. I didn't know what he was asking. Every night it was clear, but the last night it felt unclear. I felt like I wasn't where God wanted me to be, but I'm like, what, I, what, what do you want? And uh, nothing happened during the service. Nothing happened afterwards. And, and so I, I get back to, to the house that we were staying at, and, and I start to pray. And I said, God, I'm not trying to hide. I'm not trying to lock my heart off from you working on it. I just need to know, what do you want? And God brought a thought to my mind, this. And uh, well, I just, it, it was college. I, I, was, I was taking correspondence. Once I got out of uh, high school, I started taking a correspondence course right away that fall. And uh, I was serving in my local church. I was very active, doing all kinds of stuff. And yet, God says college. And so I thought, Okay, I'm, but I'm, I'm taking college courses right now. And God said, you never asked me what I wanted. And so it hit me that I, I never had. Now, I was taking college classes on theology. You know, I was studying to be a preacher because I felt God wanted me in the ministry. And so I thought, well, I don't know how and what aspect of the ministry he wants me in, so I'm just going to take the most advanced course that I can get in the ministry to touch on a whole bunch of stuff, so whatever he wants me to do, I can do. And uh, God said, you never asked what I wanted. I'm like, well, I, <laughs> it wasn't that I meant to not ask. It wasn't that I set out to do my own thing. It's, I thought I was doing good because I was trying to serve him. But he said, you never asked what I wanted. So I said, okay, what do you want? I'll do it. And uh, it turned out God wanted me to go to a certain college. And so I ended up going there in the spring since the fall had already been you know, pretty much completed. And uh, it was interesting of how God worked that all out. But I remember just in the days before going to college, all the plans that I had, I had a job that was paying decent for back then. And I was, I was set. I had all my, my thoughts. I was going to do this. I was going to get my degree and see what. I, and then now I'm going to a place I've never been to, a state I've never been to before. And why am I going here? I don't know. I just know God wants me to go there. What's going to happen? I don't know. I just know God wants me to go there. But I remember that night, the night before we were leaving to go, and I just remember thinking to myself, all these thoughts, I mean a million thoughts, what, what's this, what's what happened with this, and I just felt kind of lost, like I don't know what tomorrow is going to bring, I don't know. And it really started getting to me, like this is like everything that you planned is now changed, and, and where, where are you going to go from here, and I didn't have any plans. The only thing I knew was that God wanted me to go there. And it's, things just kind of started swirling, and it was like God came to me and said, now remember Proverbs 3, verses 5 and 6. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not unto thine own understanding. And it was like God said, you know, you don't have to understand everything that you want to understand. Now, I sure wanted to, <laughs> let me tell you. I sure wanted to understand all the questions that I had, the, what the answers were. But God said, you don't have to understand them all. But I do want you to trust in me. And it says, uh, trust in the Lord with all thine heart, lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways, acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. And he was like, you don't have to understand what I'm doing. You don't have to understand what tomorrow is going to bring. All I ask is that you trust me, and that in all your ways that you know how, just acknowledge me. Give me that preeminence, and I will direct your paths. And let me tell you that he has. Every time that I have trusted him, and allowed him to have the preeminence in my life, he has directed me. Now, there's also been times in my life I've done things my own way and I paid for it. I'm sure we can all attest to that if we're honest. But the fact is that if we will trust in the Lord and allow him to do whatever he's doing and just acknowledge him in every way that we know how, then God will direct us. Do I have all the answers for what I'm going through right now? No, I don't. But you know what I plan on doing? I plan on trusting God. 
And, and, and part of the trust of acknowledging him in all my ways is that he is going to direct my paths. I, I believe he will. Where right now? I don't know. Tomorrow, how is he going to do it? I don't know. But I just know that he will because he promised he would. And God keeps his promises. But we need to give him the preeminence. The biggest pull on my heart, as I said, standing up for freedom, is thinking about those that gave their lives to give it to us and the responsibility that I have to fight for it. But you know, there's another battle that's going on that's more important. Because frankly, if we were winning that battle, then some of the other battles that's going on right now, they wouldn't even be happening. You know the God of heaven gave his life for us to purchase our pardon. And again, our pardon. Because in the story of this battle, we aren't the good guys. You say, well, I, wait, I, I believe in God. I'm a Christian. Do you realize that your sins and mine crucified him? We're not the good guys. Every one of us, if we got what we deserved, we would be in hell. And the fact that we get saved, it doesn't change what we deserve. Do we understand that? I don't think we do sometimes, and myself included. I think I go through my life thinking, oh, I deserve heaven, but I don't. And it's, it's a shame for me to think that. You know, it's a free gift from God, and we can rejoice in that. So I don't want to say, you know, go around, you live your whole life depressed. I mean, God doesn't want that either. He wants us to be able to rejoice in that salvation he's given. But we ought not think that we deserve it. We don't want to kid ourselves. We crucified him with our sins, with our complacency and our silence in this spiritual battle. You know, it seems that the amount of time and energy that we invest in a cause is directly related to the amount of responsibility that we feel for it. How many of you feel like you are responsible for your family? Dads? How many of you are going to do whatever it takes to put food on the table for your family because you feel like great responsibility for that? Or moms, or whoever. There's a big responsibility there. How many of you have a job? And you feel the responsibility that comes with having that job and being there when you're supposed to be there, when the schedule says it's your time to work. Or if you're taking college classes and you know, you're, you're paying for that, that learning and you've got that responsibility to go and, and get that learning. The responsibility that we feel about something that really determines what we're going to do about uh, that particular cause. And so again, we need to think about how much Christ has forgiven us for. Because I don't think in my personal life that I fully understand the responsibility that I have to invest everything that I have in the cause of Christ. I think if I did have a full understanding of that responsibility, I sure would have done a whole lot more with my life up to this point. Something that has been a great conviction on me throughout this whole thing is God says, oh yeah, you're inspired to fight for your country? Well, are you inspired as much to fight for me? And shame on me if I would stand up more for my country than I would for my God. Because my country consists and exists only because my God has pleasure in it. And God set up America and God could let it fall tomorrow. And he would still be God. Eternity would still happen. You know, only what is done for Christ is going to last. Not for my country. And in no way am I putting down my country because I love my country. But man, I ought to love my God more. We all ought to. And we ought to be more inspired to fight in this spiritual battle with God and for the lives of thousands and millions of people. You know, every single person, no matter if you agree with what they say, with what they do, it doesn't matter. No matter if you love them, if you hate them, it doesn't matter. That person is someone that Jesus Christ died for and someone that he wants to spend an eternity in heaven. And it is our job to get the gospel to them. How are we doing? How have we been doing? Are we committed to this thing called Christianity? I think we are. You guys are here tonight. Some people can't make it. Some people chose not to be here. Uh, some people wouldn't come. But the fact is, are we more committed to Christianity now than we were in January? What changed? Why weren't we this inspired to fight for God and stand up for God back in January? What changed? We need to take this so serious. We need to be 
real, as Brother Colson says. Just be, be real. Be, be a true Christian. Let's be what God wants us to be. You know, Christ is coming soon. I think we can all see that. That's not even a, a question on anybody's mind. He's coming soon. But you know, everything that you plan on doing for God one day, it's never going to happen unless you start it today. If it's always one day, one day, one day, eventually you're going to run out of time. We don't have a guarantee of tomorrow. We don't have a guarantee of tonight. Some of us might not wake up in the morning. The fact is, we need to get busy for God. You know, they say, live today like it's the only day you have. There's that song that is sung about that, and I enjoy that song a lot. But let me ask you a question. When was the last time in your life that you lived one day like it was the last day that you had? We should, right? We should. How many of us can honestly say that that's how we live our lives? Like it's the last day. Like when you put your head on your pillow at night, could you rest there? And if God asked, how did you live today? Could you honestly say, God, I lived today like it was the last day that I had? And if we can't say that that's the way that we live, then the question comes, why not? Why not? Isn't living for eternity the most important thing? Does God have the preeminence in our lives? I think a lot of times we tend to kid ourselves about how closely we follow the Ten Commandments. What's the first commandment? Thou shalt have no other gods before me. And I think we say, oh, no problem there, because we are Christian. We are independent Baptist Christians, and we believe in Jesus Christ, and that he died on the cross, and we've asked him to be our Savior, and we are on our way to heaven. Well, you, you can have all that and still have other gods before him. And I'm afraid if we honestly looked at our lives, we would find many different gods throughout a day that we put in a higher position than God. God doesn't have that preeminence, but he ought to. Let's be what God wants us to be. Chances are you already know something that God wants you to do, something that's different than what you're doing now, a step that God wants you to take. If you don't know, I'm pretty sure that if you gave him a few seconds, pause and say, God, what do you want? Is there anything you need changed? Anything you want me to do? Anything you want me to stop doing? God, what would be the next step that you would like for me to take? I bet you he would show you. Chances are you probably already know. I think the biggest problem that we have as Christians is that we just don't really do the things that we know that we're supposed to. I think if all along we would have been doing the things that we knew we were supposed to be doing, I think we would probably be living in a different time right now. I think some of the issues that would be going on right now wouldn't be happening. Because isn't Jesus the answer? Isn't he? We believe that, right? So if we did our job and got the gospel out to more people and more people had Jesus, then that's a whole lot more people that wouldn't be searching for an answer right now. Right? A whole lot more people that would be able to have the same kind of mind that we have in some areas. Guys, we need to do what God has asked us to do, just the things that we know. We need to not play at this thing called Christianity. We need to give it everything that we have. I want to read something, and this was uh, by a preacher the other day. Um, he wrote, he said, We believers, this kind of goes hand in hand with what Pastor was preaching this morning, we believers as a whole have made church so non-essential. Judgment must first begin in the house of God. He is speaking. Are we listening? The stench of spiritual decay wafts from many of the houses of worship that are now crying out about our government. God is not doing this against us. He is doing this for us. Rise up, O church of God, to our knees in repentance, to our feet in heated evangelism, to arms with the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. This is not the day of the sun, sunshine patriot, but the evil day of spiritual warfare. Yes, in this spiritual battle that rages, the call goes out to arms. Are we willing to seriously take up arms in this spiritual battle and get the gospel to a lost world? Are we willing to? Guys, it terrifies me to think if this that's going on right now will not cause us to take seriously the things that we need to do, what will? 
what will. This could be the last opportunity that God gives America for revival. This could be something that God could use to bring revival to his people. You know, if you look through the centuries, when God brought pain, suffering, and heartache to the people, allowed persecution to happen, the people turned to God in a big way. But if we have enough money in the bank to outlast the quarantine, and we have enough long suffering to say, you know what, hey, we're just going to relax under all these things that are going on, not make a big deal. If we can just wait a few months, things will get back to normal. Hey, we are going to be in major, major trouble. Major, major trouble than even before this whole thing happened. And I'm talking spiritually. Things might get back completely to normal in our society. But if we don't change as Christians, that, that might be the end. That might be the end. I really believe that. The fact is that God should have the preeminence. and We ought to give it to him. We have got to turn to God, folks. It is our responsibility. We have got to own this. We have got to realize how much of a responsibility that we have. Now, we, of course, ought not to think of ourselves more highly than we ought to think and think that we somehow single-handedly serving God are going to accomplish these great and wonderful things. No, 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 no. It's about day in and day out saying, God, what is the next step? How can I acknowledge you in every single thing I do today? How can I keep you in that preeminent spot in my life, not just when I'm at church, not just at work, but when I'm alone driving in my car, when I am talking to friends, when I invite people over to my house, as I'm raising my kids, as I'm going to the store, as I'm talking with people, whatever we are doing, God has to have that preeminence. God, how can I acknowledge you in all my ways? And guys, if we can't do that as Christians, and if this will not awake us, to do what we're supposed to do and to take things seriously, then what will? What will? But I don't want to leave tonight as a downer. I, I don't want to think, oh, man, we're in trouble, and we're terrible, and it's over. No! We serve a powerful God, a risen Savior, do we not? We serve a God that has great power, a God that can, can overrule and override any ruling that is made, a God who is just so powerful that he laughs at the most intricate and, and detailed plans of, of the wicked. And God says, I want to use you. I, I'm not only willing to forgive you and, 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 and cleanse you from your sin and be able to bring you to heaven and live for me when you don't deserve it. I love you. I want a relationship with you. And I want the whole process to be easy. My yoke is easy. My burden is light. You know, the closer you get to God, the more you'll find out it's true. The farther you get away from God, the more you're taking on yourself. You know, I need God. I've got, I've got some burdens I could really use him, you know, his help with. And when I look at uh, the things that, you know, standing up for God, it's not always easy. Is it going to be easy to go through persecution? No, it's not. So I want to get as close to God as I can so he can bear as much as that, of that burden as, as he can, you know. I want to get as close to God and be able to experience his help in, 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 in the biggest way as I can. And you know what? God wants that too. God says, come. Come to me. He's like, I'll give you rest. If you can't make it on your own, don't worry about it. I have power. It's my power that works in you. If you deny it, that, that, that's, that's on you. But my power is available to work through you. And I, for one, I want to experience that. I really do. Here's the thing. You say, well, I've done too much, I can't be used, or I, I don't know enough to really be of any use to God. Well, I want you to think about the apostles, 12 men, whole wide range of society, from a fisherman to someone who was very well educated. You know, God used these people to turn the world upside down, 12 people, 12 people. Now, they went through some stuff. <laughs> you read what they went through in history. And this, to me, is, I don't know if you've ever read The Case for Christ. It's a fantastic book. You should read it. But this, to me, is one of the strongest arguments for Christianity, was the apostles and how they lived. What possible motivation could these men have had that saw Christ, that knew him personally, what motivation could they possibly have had to live for him after he died on the cross? Did it gain them anything financially? No. They were ridiculed. They were tortured. They were beaten. And a lot of them were killed. 
but they lived for God anyway. Now, why? Because they spent time with him, and he said all these things that he was going to do, and then he died on the cross. So I ask you, what gain, what, what, what possible gain, what possible motivation could have they had to live for God and give their lives for him after that? Unless they really did see him again after the fact and realize that everything he said was true. That's the only reason why it would make sense. If, if you can think of another one, please come and tell me. I can't think of another reason. They were willing to give up everything because they realized that what he said was true. He was who he said he was. And you know what? We need to understand that as well. We haven't got a chance to see him. And God talks about, you know, blessed are those who believe that have never seen. And what is it that enables us to please God? It's faith. That substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Without faith, we can't please God. So I just ask you tonight, would you be one of those people that God could use? We might be unlearned. We might be ignorant. But can people take knowledge of us that we have been with Jesus? All you need to do tonight is just say, God, here I am. Help me to acknowledge you in all my ways. What way? You tell me, I'll do it. I'll trust that you guide me. What, what, what does it mean, God? What, what does it mean for the next five years? What does it mean for the plans that I currently have? What does it mean for my job? What does it mean for our country? What is it? You know what? You don't even have to understand all that. I know you want to. Believe me, I do too, okay? But just trust in him. Acknowledge him in all your ways, and he will direct your paths. And with the God of heaven directing your paths, you know that you're going to end up on the winning side. Isn't that awesome? Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for the opportunity that we have tonight to uh, be here, and I thank you for each and every person that is here. Lord, I pray that you would work in all of our hearts. Lord, as I said before, Lord, I, I bet you that probably the vast majority of us here tonight, we already know what you want us to do, that next step that you want us to take. And uh, Lord, I pray that if there's someone here that maybe just hasn't taken time to thought about it or to think about it like I did, Lord, at one point, and I just say, God, you know, what is it that you want? Lord, if we just haven't taken the time to ask you what you want, I pray we do that tonight. And then, Lord, I pray that you would help us to live like this is our last day. It might be. We don't know. Lord, I pray that uh, we wouldn't go back to how things were. I pray that we would live in a new normal, but a new normal of being a fully committed Christian 24-7, doing what it is that you've had for us to do all along. Lord, being a warrior in that spiritual battle that is going on for the souls of men. Lord, I pray that we depend on you, that we wouldn't try to do it in our own strength. And I pray that you would give us wisdom and guidance as we go along, but Lord, help us just to trust you and just allow you to guide our paths. Help us just to be able to have peace in knowing that you have power, that we don't need to fear because you're with us. But Lord, whatever it is that you'd have us do tonight, I pray that we would just yield to you and allow you to work in our hearts the way and lives the way that you see fit. Let's go ahead and stand.